I wanted to do a little demo of a uh, workflow that I've been noodling around on recently. This is just a <coughs> tool using Revit 2021, uh, doing a study on uh, social distancing and spacing inside of an office environment, and uh, just walk through a little bit of how, how this was put together and why it was put together. Basically, this is a tool that allows you to go through and you can um, specify an office environment and pick a particular chair that is used in that office environment that might be sort of throughout a whole floor. Here we've got sort of a relatively big floor with a couple hundred chairs in it and wanting to make sure that you're only using about half of the available chairs and making sure that of all the chairs that you're using that they're all at least six feet apart from them basically related to some of the guidelines on COVID-19 related work and the idea that you know there's going to be a bunch of different ways that that could possibly be instantiated there's lots of different ways to have only 50 percent of the chairs used and make sure that they're all you know so so far apart from each other and there's different ways to just sort of look at that inside of the environment of a revit model so um the 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 genesis of this came from basically looking at things like the aia have put out a reoccupancy assessment tool recently for workplace workplace reoccupancy and you know i'm a I'm part of a tool making group. So, you know, we go around with hammers and we look for nails that we can hit with it. And a lot of people seem to be, you know, thinking about this and concerned with this, uh, pretty rightfully so. And so, you know, this is this is a pretty good set of guidelines. Um, some of the things that the AI is looking at are, you know, what's most effective and what's least effective, starting by the idea of elimination, like don't go to the office and then you don't have to worry about uh, becoming infected. Uh, so social isolation is one approach. Substitution is not applicable. That is, you cannot substitute COVID-19 for something else, unfortunately. Um, but then we get into things like engineering controls, like how do you start adjusting ventilation? Um, how do you start doing things like working from home and then eventually down into the least effective around masks, respirators, and gloves in terms of things that we can affect? Um, so it is, it's an interesting set of guidelines. You know, it it isn't everything. It, it is a good starting place to sort of start thinking about some of these ideas. Um, and, you know, from a, from a toolmaker point of view, sort of looking at these guidelines and saying, okay, where can the stuff that we're working on start to become effective in this? And just starting at the top, you know, priority, elimination, second priority, substitution, and starting to get into things like, okay, adapting space to meet public health needs. Um, you know, how do you use the existing space that you have? Um, you know, from, from my point of view on the tool side, it became a little bit more obvious when you get into things like space planning how you can start doing some kinds of metrics around um, generative design methodologies and uh, automation to start doing some of these processes in a way that's automatable and repeatable. Looking particularly here at 3.2 space planning, how can we automate the process of reducing density and or increasing spacing of furniture? So reducing density on a certain level, uh, a lot of offices, like, you know, my office, we're considering things like percentage of occupancy, you know, starting at things like 25%, moving to 30 and 50 and so on, until you get you know, sort of closer up to a full occupancy of an office space, uh, but also the idea of staggering workstations where possible and rotating them to space the same direction. Basically, there seemed like there was an opportunity to look at these things of staggering stations, reducing density, and so approaching it sort of in that way. Of course, there's lots of different things that you can do, some of them more effective, some of them less effective, uh, but basically using this as a starting point for these kinds of guidelines. So if we go back over to this tool, uh, it's, uh, and we can look at this one over here. So uh, starting off with a floor plan and saying, how can I get rid of uh, half the workstations, essentially just turn on or off half the workstations or 30% of the workstations and also make sure that they're six feet apart because those two things are, there's multiple different ways to combine those kinds of goals. So this tool does that. Uh, I'm, I'm making it up as a uh, generative design study, but we can look in a little bit about the logic of what it does. And in looking at that logic, there's basically a, a method by which you can choose a pathway through this workspace where you're going, you know, how are you going to order 
this pathway through your workspace in order to just get 50% of the workstations? And then how can you change that pathway to try different opportunities for measuring whether or not they're all six feet apart from each other? So taking those two six feet apart, 50% occupancy, and putting them in relationship to each other. So if we go back out to the Dynamo definition, uh, I've got this tool, which I'll post out so people can take a look at it if they want to. It's uh, not crazy complicated, uh, certainly in terms of other uh, Dynamo workflows. You know, it, it basically fits on a screen, uh, you know, a little bit tiny, but you can read all the, the groupings. And I'll walk through a little bit about what it does. What you're seeing right now is uh, basically a representation of all the black dots in the background are all of the chairs that are available to basically be looking at. Green are the uh, workstations that have been activated, and they're all the ones that have been activated that align with a six-foot spacing from each other. And I'll just sort of point out a couple of things about how this graph works right now. Uh, so just to move that a little bit out of the way, everything in pink are things that basically get changed in order to try different arrangements of those chairs. Uh, so these are the things that get changed initially as you say, what are the chairs that I want to use? And then this is a bit of logic that goes through and says, how do I order a pathway through all of these chairs so that I can drop half of them? And then on the output side, there's basically uh, a visual representation that happens here where you say, Let's let's represent all of the good desks with green, and let's measure uh, the outcome of that. How many of the chairs are more than six feet apart, and what percent of full occupancy do we have for this current state? And there's then another output here for actually going and spilling all that information into the Revit model to basically use uh, override elements uh, by color in order to represent it back in the Revit model. So back at the high level, we can walk through this. In order to get the chair family that's being used, let's just take a look at that guy. Uh, pretty straightforward. Select family instance, get the type, then you get all the uh, families of that type, picks them all out. Uh, now I want to go through and make sure that all the chairs that I'm selected are only those ones that are on the floor that I picked. So uh, we have a little namespace collision here, of course, with math floor, which is a, an, a rounding methodology, but it's also confusing because it's getting all the chairs that are on the same floor. <coughs> so uh, I get all the chairs that are uh, available, and then I compare them to the chair that I picked, make sure that they all basically equal each other in terms of their height. Once I get all of those things, I also want to make sure that um, I don't that if I want to use this multiple times, I can override the colors on those elements and keep resetting them back to um, non-green before making a new set green. And that's what this little bit of logic over here does. This is basically a color override reset. Then this is, this is where it gets a little bit more fun. Um, in order to run outside of Revit, which is what the the generative design aspect does of like going through multiple different iterations in order to find different ways of doing a combination of 50% occupancy and six feet apart. Uh, we have a cache node which basically stuffs all of the geometric information from the model into this little thing and then it can run outside of the Revit environment which is one of the cool things about the new generative design tools. And then this is sort of my little heuristic for going through and making a new path through the workspace. So if we look at all of the chairs that are available for us to be uh, examining, basically what I'm doing here is I'm saying there is an probably infinite number of ways that we could order all of these little black dots. And the way that I am ordering all of these little black dots is that I'm basically getting a bounding box through uh, all of those, uh, around all of those elements with this circle. I'm uh, making points along that whole perimeter. And then I'm sort of creating a zigzag line that connects the dots all the way through this, like so. 
And so once I get that sort of connect the dots zigzag line, I can say, where are all of these desks along the parameter space of this curve? And what that gives me is uh, a sort of an intelligent way to keep getting different organizations of all of those desks. And I can change things like the density of that path in order to get different organizations of all of those desks, or I can rotate that uh, zigzag in order to look at different ways to, again, organize all of those desks in slightly different ways, but in sort of a, a rational order. Um, what this allows the, the generative design aspect, the, uh, which has a, a genetic algorithm in the background, which basically is going to twiddle these knobs to find better and worse ways to organize those chairs so that I can get 50% of them in a particular order and then measure those 50% to see how many of them are six feet apart from each other. Clear as mud? Clear as mud. So once I get all of those orderings of chairs, uh, I go through and I drop half of them um, over here, where I say drop every other chair, and I have a way to sort of shift whether I start on the first one or I start on the second one. So between all of those things of shifting the starting point, changing the resolution of that scribble, and changing the orientation of that scribble, I actually get a fairly uh, rational set of new organizations of these chairs that I can then measure. So after I drop half of them, I go through and I make sure that um, I've isolated the chairs that are six feet or less from each other. So now I've got my two criteria. I've got 50% of my chairs, and I've got only those chairs of the 50% that are six feet or less from each other. And then I do some coloring, and then I do some measuring of you know how many chairs do I have that are six feet apart, and what percentage of full occupancy is that. And then I have my logic over here in order to dump some of that information when I want to back into the Revit model. So all of that is basically um, one Dynamo graph. What I can do is I can go into generative design. I can export this for generative design, um, which basically allows me to then publish this so that I can interact with it directly through the, the Revit interface. I can give this to other people if they want to use it in their office in order to do this sort of measurement. So I can export that thing, uh, bam, like that. I can put a little information about what people need to do in order to interact with it, and then we're good to go. So what that gives us then is this tool that we can use in different environments. So uh, we were looking at it in one environment. Here's another one uh, where now I have this tool that I can say create study. Once I get that create study, you can see I've got a, a couple different generative design workflows. There's some of the ones that are shipped out of the box, uh, grid placement, uh, view windows. Uh, here's a couple that I made that are just kind of fun. Here's my pottery generator and other tools. And if you scroll down, you see I've got the tool that I just made, 50% uh, occupancy tool. If I launch it up, you get a couple of things that happen. Um, I can name this. I can say you know, this is study one, and I'm going to try and optimize. Um, I could do a random assortment, but I have some optimization criteria. Uh, I have a prompt to select a family instance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push that, and then I can go in and I can say, this is a chair that is going to be typical for my floor plate. And I'm basically ready to go at that point. Uh, basically, it'll show the, the variables that I'm going to change are those orderings, the resolution of the grid, and the shifting of the starting chair. So remember from that graph, this is basically going to take a big hoop around all of these chairs. It's going to make that squiggly line through here, and it's going to keep varying that squiggly line until it gets better and better results. Um, I can also adjust this goal. So chairs more than six feet apart, I want to maximize those number of chairs. Percentage of full occupancy, let's say we maximize. Remember, this is hardwired to only go to a maximum of 50%. However, uh, a lot of people are doing things like 30% occupancy to get started with. So I can even um, vary that a little bit. I can set my constraints to, I actually want a variation of that squiggly line going through here that gives me something like, um, give me something between 
30, you know, 29% and 30%. So I'm actually going to neck down the allowable space for this thing into a subset of 50%. So I actually should probably have more options that come out of that. Uh, we'll keep the population size there. We'll change anything. And off we go to the races. So what's happening now is uh, basically the, the background routine is being spun up where you can go and you can see uh, there's going to be a whole bunch of sub processes that are going to get spun up in the background where uh, Dynamo is essentially scooping a bunch of information out of Revit and running them in background processes. These are the REST Dynamo cores. These are all little instances of Dynamo that have scooped out that information from the Revit model and are processing in a background thread. So I can keep working in Revit basically while those things are going on. It's a non-blocking offer. Uh, so, and then it just starts spilling back some of the results. Uh, so, you know, while that's working, I can still keep going into the Revit model and do other stuff. But uh, here my results start coming back in. I can see the preview of all of those chairs in my floor plan. And I can pick out individual ones and look at them. So for instance, I can see that um, in this one, uh, you know, this, this top row of chairs right here, for instance, uh, is just saying, forget about this top row of chairs. We're just going to start. We're going to drop those out entirely. And we're only going to look at this arrangement of desks and chairs. Um, there are different kinds of combinations, again, of ways to satisfy those requirements that I said. So uh, all of these basically are going to have the same number of chairs and the percent of full occupancy. Uh, it's sort of a rounding error in here to 0 0.29, so it's 29%. Uh, um, all of these are basically going to be around 29%, and they're all going to be 31 desks. But these are different arrangements that every single one of them satisfies the requirements of 30% occupancy and uh, as many chairs that you can get inside of 30% occupancy that are six feet apart. So I have options, basically. And given those sorts of options, I can also just go in and start looking at what are the different combinations if I actually put this into this environment where uh, I can actually sort of see it in my Revit model. So I just hit the Create Revit Elements button and basically what this is doing is it's going in and using uh, element overrides in order to color things. So I can see, okay, now I've got, you know, this one combination that I have is actually pretty good because, you know, I know that this is a main thoroughfare and lots of people are not up here against the main thoroughfare. So they're not going to be breathing each other's oxygen. Um, you know, maybe I want to switch around a couple of these people, which I can because, you know, I could go in here and say, well, for this particular instance, you know, maybe I don't want to have that one activated so I can override it by elements. And, you know, I could go in and turn off the coloration on this one and say, no, not so much. Um, let's, let's not use that one. But while I'm in here, I could just, I can manually override these things and say, yeah, but this one, I do actually want it to be using that uh, filtration. So anyway, you, all of these things are real Revit elements, and you can override them and change them. Or you can go back through here and say, you know, maybe there's another arrangement that I like better, and I can create Revit elements from that. And then it will go back in. It'll reset all of the individual element overrides, and then it'll try a different combination. So, it, you know, for this floor plate, there's lots of different ways that you can sort of slice it so that you can have 30% occupancy and six-foot spacing. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll, post, I'll post this uh, Dynamo file if anybody is interested in using it. Um, you know, you can use it directly through the Dynamo interface. You can also publish it out uh, into the generative design tool sets here if people want to just interact with it through this kind of interface. So either way that you go. So uh, thank you for listening, and I hope this was useful. Uh, you know, again, this, this isn't solving everybody's problems, but it can give you a tool set to allow you to start addressing specific problems that you might be addressing within a workspace environment and uh, for this particular point in time in history. Thanks for listening.